So welcome to the webinar on lowering the barrier for customized microassistance in medical applications, um, which is in fact organized by Health in collaboration with Europractice. Um, my name is Jan Lacock, I'm from DSP Valley and one of the founding members of the uh, cluster, the health cluster Health. Um, maybe a few rules. Uh, you're all familiar with this uh, because of Corona, uh, but anyway, keep your microphone muted, uh, switch off your camera. Um, sometimes it happens that people start sharing their screen, try to avoid that. And uh, so what we also do is, because we are with so many, please, uh, we use the chat for the questions. Um, and also there will be a question and answer session at the end of the, uh, the whole webinar. Um, talking about Flanders.health, Flanders.health, the, the health cluster in Flanders. Um, and uh, we are there to foster innovation and strengthen the competitiveness of our companies in the health sector. Um, and it, in fact, this whole cluster is, is, is a result of the collaboration of three existing clusters, um, namely Flanders of Bio, Medtech Flanders and DSP Valley. And as such, um, in fact, we are working on, 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 the cross on, the, on the crossover of the three main technologies on which, uh, in fact, a lot of innovation in health is happening, namely life sciences, medtech, and digital uh, technologies. Um, this webinar, uh, although we are a health cluster, we're organizing this webinar, it's about chips. You're saying uh, chips, we don't hear that much about chips. Uh, it's always about other things like AI or whatever. Um, but nowadays, uh, if, if you go to uh, the news, uh, it's all over the news uh, chips nowadays and uh, maybe it's negative news uh, talking about a shortage of uh, chips integrated circuits uh, but it clearly shows to all of us that uh, chips integrated integrated circuits are really um, the enabling uh, one of the main enabling technologies of many applications so uh, we cannot without them so uh, we will not have a car nowadays without a chip uh, and this is uh, in fact also happening and in, in the health technology uh, in the health uh, world is that most of the innovations happening there are um, enabled by uh, integrated circuit technology microelectronics nanoelectronics photonics uh, when you talk about uh, telehealth wearables uh, artificial intelligence whatever everything is all enabled only because we have uh, the technology of uh, microelectronics, nanoelectronics available to us. Um, and maybe uh, I hope that, of course, this shortage will not happen in the medical world because it's probably it would be worse than having to wait a couple of weeks uh, for your car. Um, then I'm coming to the agenda of today. Uh, so my few words were in fact an introduction to uh, I would I would hope and I believe a much more interesting uh, presentations that will fall um, and we will uh, start uh, with an overview by um, of uh, of uh, microsystems and metal ap applications and uh, how uh, your practice uh, can help there to barrier uh, to technology access uh, by Romana Hofmann who is uh, managing um, who is a uh, uh, program director in IMEC, but I think he will also, he will give this presentation mainly in his role as general manager of uh, Europe practice. And after that, uh, we will be able to listen to uh, five uh, very interesting uh, case studies, uh, but they will uh, introduced after the presentation of Romano. Uh, Romano, I propose that you take the floor now. Then I will, um... Uh, start. So indeed, as Johan said, and thanks for the introduction, Johan, I will um, dive a bit deeper in microsystems and medical applications and how your practice can lower the barrier for technology access and mainly focusing on academics and startups, as you will also see later on in the use cases that are planned. Um, so healthcare and the medical world really has gone through um, an enormous, I would say, progression. Uh, so you can see here a painting 
from the Middle Ages where you see a surgeon trying to remove something from somebody's head. And you can see it's really something that we don't want to see anymore in our lives. I think also the uh, Corona crisis or the pandemic has learned that uh, there has been many advances in healthcare. I mean, who would have thought that we would have developed uh, so many different uh, vaccines in within a year? I mean, this is a really tremendous progress. And you can see here in the picture that today towards the future, you will see in a surgery room really like um, artificial intelligence, virtual reality coming into play. And this is just a picture taken from uh, Philips where they show their fiber optical real shape technology. So really for guided uh, surgery and these are really big advances and that will help us in our daily lives yeah, to really get a, a better and a longer uh, life expectancy. So many of those things are driven by Moore's law and Moore's law was actually already into effect before Moore uh, invented his law. Uh, so Moore's law says that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years. Um, Gordon Moore was in that time the, the, the CEO of Intel when he, he put this down and you can see that this law is already in, in into progression for more than 100 years and we still keep up this space. And, and, and this is very important because it enables a lot of innovation, is really driving innovation in the automotive world, in the medical world, everywhere. And the base behind this is that this doubling of transistors makes, uh, well, makes it that you can make devices smaller, faster, consuming less power and also more functionality. And of course, that can be applied in many different areas. And that's why you see such an uprising of, uh, of chips and especially customized chips. And that's why we are now struggling also with that short shortage. Yeah? So this evolution you can also see in pacemaker technology. So also there you can see downscaling and that's really thanks to the, the, the chips that also can be downscaled. So here you see, for instance, uh, the, the first pacemaker in 1958. So you could see it was quite heavy, um, also big size. Um, and then you see over the years that um, well, different companies have made it smaller and smaller. So it's a picture that I took from the St. Jude Medical uh, center and you can really see that now um, there are uh, pacemakers which they call leadless pacemakers which are very small and uh, also consume uh, not so much power and there are even um, advances where the pacemaker takes the power from the the beating of the heart so this is really big advances thanks to chip technology again you see the same uh, or a similar trend for hearing aids here we go a, big, a bit further back in time. So we uh, end up here in uh, 1634, where you have the ear trumpet invented by a French priest. So you can see it's a very big device. Of course, there was no electronics uh, involved in this case. And then from the time there was electronics coming up, you could see that you get on one hand um, smaller, but also added functionality. Because you see here, for instance, in the 2000s, so in this century, that the hearing aids really get, um, yeah, um, coupling to the to the uh, smartphone, uh, so you can also, pr in principle, listen to your radio and everything that is possible uh, through the uh, to the device. So this is also really a big advance again, thanks to microelectronics and microchips. Not only the small things uh, need uh, chips or ASICs, uh, which stands for application specific IC. Uh, also in the what we call hospital care, you see that uh, chips are really playing more and more a predominant role. So here I took a picture from an article from um, a group in Italy who has used the your practice services to make those chips. And you can see here an array of ASICs um, mounted on, you could say, the coil of an MRI scanner. And also for X-ray scanners, you have a, a similar thing that uh, the chips and ASICs play a predominant role and uh, become more and more important. So you can see really that microchips are re revolutionary, uh, revolutionizing healthcare, not only in hospital care, but also in point of care, and then typically also with the combination of microfluidics. Uh, implantables, like I showed the, the pacemakers, but also you could also have neurostimulators or um, stimulators to, to keep the pain under control. Wearables, of course, you have seen it in your own uh, Fitbit or uh, Apple Watch. 
And then uh, also more and more you see an advance towards uh, human machine interfacing. Of course, this sounds far future, but it's closer and more nearby than you think. Yeah. So custom ASIC is really the business differentiator. So while I would say in the past um, chip technology was only accessible for the big ones like Intel and uh, and in the time when I was still working for Philips and SD Microelectronics and TI. Now you could say that uh, chips is uh, within reach of everyone who has uh, some money and, and some money is really not a lot of money. You can really start to make a chip already with um, a few hundred case. Supposing you can also do the design. Yeah, I mean, if the design also needs to be done, then you talk about a big higher number. But the custom silicon is really business differentiator because it is uh, not so expensive, as I said. So you can me make your product cheaper. You can make it smaller. So the form factor, you can shrink it. You also can have higher performance. You can differentiate yourself also uh, by protecting your intellectual property because the chip is custom. So it's not something that you take off the shelf. So you can really put IP in there and you can differentiate your in the market. And again, um, we see that now really startups can also benefit from that technology. And that's why you see such an uprise also in the medical world. Well, I would say, yeah, 50 years ago, all the innovation was happening in, in the big companies. Now you really say that the startups are driving this innovation and then typically when they become so successful, they get bought by the big ones eh? like Medtronic or others or Boston Scientific. But you really can see that uh, custom silicon is within reach and that innovation has really come into play here. So the ASIC development flow uh, goes as follows. Uh, so you start with a system specification where from that you deduct your specifications of the IC which then comes into a feasibility study and then you can start with your design. Either you do it yourself, as I said, but there are also design houses around us. In the Benelux, we have really a lot of design houses. I saw, for instance, that Caroline from ICSense is in uh, in the house. So if you need help to design, you you can find enough design houses around Leuven, around Eindhoven and the other cities. Then once the design is there, I said already that you can really very low cost manufacture um, a few samples and that we do in MPW mode. That stands for multi project wafer. So you share the cost and you will see that later in another slide that I have with other customers and that's why you reduce the cost. Once you have those samples, you want to have them have, have them packaged. And once you have them packaged, you also want to have them tested and qualified. And then once you have all of this, so that's the phase three, which we call the industrialization, then you can go eventually to mass production and bring your product to, to the market. So you can see in the different steps, you could also have different steps in, in financing. So again, for startups, it's really something where they can jump on the wagon and really uh, yeah, start to also explore what is possible with uh, silicon. So what role does your practice play? Well, your practice is an um, organization um, which is a collaboration with different institutes, as you will see later, that supported uh, in the past mainly academic institutions. And you see here all the red dots that represent your practice members. So these are both universities and research centers who do innovation, research and also teaching in microelectronics. And then mainly uh, as you see here on, on the left, uh, towards uh, CAD tools, so design tools, we, we make them affordable and available to, this to those institutions. But also I need to stress here that also startups who are like originating out of this institution can use those design tools under favorable conditions, at least for their prototypes. And then with that prototype, they can again to investors and then they can take a new uh, cycle and then pursue an, uh, a commercial license. Next to that, I said already that we also offer access to technology, so that means MPW runs, but in principle we also allow um, higher volumes. And then the last pillar is training. Uh, like you, you can imagine that not everyone is, is trained from the start in those technologies or in those design flows, uh, so we offer that uh, entire scope to the academic um, 
but also to the startup world in, in Europe, as you can see. The service is also open for outside Europe, but that it's only the access to, te to the technology, so not the, the design tools and also really not the training. The webinars that we offer you will see are open, but that is more high level. So the partners that um, yeah, constitute uh, Europe practice are IMEC as the coordinator, then CMP in France, Fraunhofer IES in Erlangen, Germany, then Tyndall um, as the system integration partner from uh, Cork, Ireland, and then UKRI or STFC, and some people will, will know them under RAL, the Rutherford Appleton Lab um, in Ditcot, UK, and they are responsible for the access to the design tools and the training. So then one slide on each of the pillars. So design tool portfolio, you can see that we have um, most of, or you could say almost all of the, the, the big design tool vendors. Uh, so maybe to mention a few, the big ones are of course Cadence, uh, Synopsys and Mentor, that is now Siemens. Um, and, but maybe an important one to mention here uh, because it's Flemish is uh, Lucida Photonics. Um, in the past, of course, we also had Phoenix software for Photonics, but that has been bought by Synopsys. So you can really see that we offer everything from, you could say, a very advanced ASIC design towards uh, uh, Photonics and also MEMS. Again, those are ac um, accessible for academics and the startups who are originating from those academics. Then foundries and uh, technologies. So we offer a very variety of uh, technologies and foundries. So ranging from the very advanced um, uh, ASIC te or CMOS technology in TSMC or in global foundries, but also more uh, specialized like high voltage processors in, in XFAP. Also photonics, as I said. So we have, uh, for instance, Lionics, our own iMac Fab, Cornerstone, CA Lati. And then we also have MEMS from MEMSCAP and also from XFAP. So you can see we, we cover really a large space and that's very important because yeah, you want to open as many possibilities for the academics so that they can really continue their innovation. And it's very important to do that um, yeah, low barrier, uh, so to, to make it affordable. And that I try to show here on this slide. Uh, so this is explaining the MPW process in a bit more detail. And um, as um, yeah, a commercial party, you can go, for instance, to an XFAP and, and, and do there your own MPW. For TSMC, it's not possible because there you they only uh, hunt for the big ones, so to speak. So there you need to come to companies like, like us, uh, iMac or others. But in Europractice, we do something special. So there we uh, buy an entire MPW block and then we cut it in pieces, what we call the mini ASIC pieces. And that is illustrated here. So you see in this table, um, on the first column, you see the nodes. On the, on the second column, you see the mask and the prototype cost for the different nodes. So you can see for 28 nanometer, you would need more than a million euros to really start your full mask, your proprietary mask and then production. Yeah? Um, then if you go in MPW mode, you can see you can lower that cost already to, uh, to 41. Uh, thousand euros, but then I would say that is maybe still too expensive for some of the academic institutions. So what we do is that you see here and it's uh, uh, animated. Oh, that was a bit too quick. You can see here that we uh, break the MPW block in three blocks and we can even divide it in more. So we can then bring it down to 13K euros and if we now even have an offer where you can order only one square millimeter and then it's I think only 8,000 euros. So you can see it's really affordable again if you can make the design yourself. So your practice does it already for a very long time as I said and here you can see the can you please go on mute because there is somebody not on mute. Thank you. Um, so you can see that from uh, 1995 when we, we started, so then we didn't have any fabricated design, but the year after immediately, then we had already 461. And that was mainly also because the commission was paying for those of this, uh, this fabrication runs. So that's why it was immediately a high number. Then later on, that uh, ground from the commission uh, stopped, but still the service was supported. And you can see that gradually we, we we kept to an, uh, um, yeah, a firm level, I would say, 
And the last year we jumped because we 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 also integrated CMP in the service and we added some uh, additional uh, runs here. So you can see we are really supporting a lot of uh, academics and startups with um, their designs. And if you zoom in then on the yeah, what what are they interested in? What kind of technologies do they use? You can see that predominantly they still use the older nodes, mostly because they are still more affordable, but, but also because there are many things still possible. Many people would not imagine that, but in point 18, you can still do a lot for medical applications, as I will show in my next slides. Um, you can also see that silicon photonics is really coming up. So we had 46. Uh, in 2020 and even the year before we had I think around 70. So also that is coming more and more uh, up and Jan Willem Hoste from Antilope, he will dive into specifically his domain of silicon nitride photonics. And then you can see the advanced notes that they also take um, a large part of the cake. Uh, so the 28 for instance had 108 designs. Then training courses, so we offer training courses to academics and in principle also to the startups from there. So we have zoom in mainly on the design tools and the technologies that we offer in Europe practice. So before COVID, those trainings were very hands on, and so people were really in a, in a classroom together with the teacher. And there are also multiple levels, so really from beginner level to very advanced and over different topics and so going from analog IC design up to um, TCAT photonics etc. And then in um, the pandemic we moved to webinars so we had a conducted webinar on microfluidics. We had one um, uh, last year at the end of last year on silicon photonics and then we kicked off uh, today this morning one on MEMS and so if you're interested in MEMS then I would recommend to join that. You can also re-watch everything on our YouTube channel so that uh, is open for everyone. Then a few uh, design examples before I give the floor to the use case um, speakers. So I, I said that many people can still use the older technology. So here you have an example of TSMC 180 nanometer, a mixed signal RF. Uh, this is a uh, design example of the Technical University of Delft, where they have um, integrated a um, uh, front end ASIC with an um, yeah, uh, a subarray beam forming, so it's a uh, 33 by 33 uh, PZT matrix transducer, and they use it to to bring the uh, gastroscopic tube into the esophagus, and by doing that, you can bring the device quite close to the heart, huh? so it's not uh, it's in the in the the tube or your esophagus yourself, and therefore you can really do very good uh, ECG monitoring. For, uh, so that is a really nice project that was done together uh, with the Erasmus Medical Center and O-Delft Ultrasound and uh, SME in the Netherlands in Delft. Here is another example from uh, the University of Bath. Here they used the XFAP MEMS uh, XMB10, so it's an inertial platform from XFAP. And this is actually the winner of the uh, XFAP uh, design competition that we did together with them. And here you can see they develop uh, capacitive MEMS sensors for uh, high resolution uh, vibrotactical displays. So it's like um, uh, visual impaired people. They can feel um, on, the, the, on the display uh, what is uh, displayed on the smartphone. So it's like a uh, kind of brain, uh, but then active one. So it's also a very nice application. And then, of course, I also had to show photonics uh, because I've shown ASICs, uh, MEMS and then photonics. Here's an example from uh, Technion, that's the uh, Israeli Institute of Technology. And here you see combination of silicon uh, photonics from our iMac foundry combined with Tyndall packaging. Uh, so you see here on the, on the left and on the right an, um, a gold coated um, a fiber array that couples into the, the silicon chip and it's um, the application, of course, you can imagine that this is just a prototype to 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 show the proof of principle. It's a silicon photonic array for ultrasound detection. Again, that can be used for um, for life sciences or for healthcare. And all these examples and many more you can find into our uh, Europe Practice Activity Reports. Who have just um, published it uh, last week. At the moment, it's only in PDF form, but we plan to also print it. Um, but we are with COVID, it's a bit uh, uh, tricky to send it around uh, to the different places and people are not there anyhow. So we 
plan to do that later, but if you're interested, just send me a mail and we will give you a physical copy later. So having that said, I want to introduce the, the speakers of the use cases. Um, um, the order is the following. So we will start with Steve Stoffels from Pulsify Medical. who will speak on their ultrasound monitoring patch. Uh, and the title is um, Future Medical Grade Wearables Enabling Customer Components. That will be followed by Jan Willem Hoste from uh, Antilope Diagnostics. So he will focus much more on the silicon nitride photonics that um, enables them to make a photonics um, yeah, system to to, uh, to to bring that even to the consumer market. Then we go to the academic people from first from the Technical University of Eindhoven, Peter Harpe. He will zoom in on uh, microelectronics for ambulatory pregnancy monitoring, but also ultrasound catheters. Then Faso uh, from the Technical University of Delft and also she's uh, assigned to Fraunhofer ISTM in Berlin. She will speak on um, microelectronic chips for bioelectronic medicine, so mainly the, the neural implants. And then the last speaker of the day will be Bob Peers from the Technical University of Leuven. Uh, sorry, the Catholic <laughs> University of Leuven, uh, the MICAS. Uh, he will focus more on MEMS and more particularly on the um, uh, concept of a high resolution neural interface with polymer CMOS hybrid interconnects. So having that said, I conclude my talk and I give the floor to Steve. So I will stop sharing my screen. Yeah, all right. Uh, thanks a lot for your introduction, uh, Roman, and thanks You're also welcome. for the opportunity to uh, uh, for us to uh, give a short talk about uh, about what we're doing. Uh, one minute. Let me share my uh, my screen. I have everything open here. So all right. So I hope everybody can see the presentation. Yes, we can. Yeah, OK, excellent, excellent. Good, um, so we'll start with first a short introduction on what, what we're actually trying to, to make. Uh, so the company is made Pulsif named Pulsify Medical. What we're trying to make is an ultrasound monitoring patch. So that entails everything which we try to do actually. Yeah? So we work with ultrasound, we do that in a patch format, and we want to enable uh, monitoring uh, with ultrasound. This means that we're gonna do long-term uh, longitudinal measurements. Uh, and so traditionally ultrasound is mainly used as a diagnostic tool where a doctor does, let's say, point of care measurement. Uh, well, not a point of care, but like a, a spot measurement, maybe for 10 minutes, half an hour, checks what's going on. But they already know beforehand uh, kind of where and at what time they need to look. So it's it's more diagnosis. So we want to take that into the into the time domain. If you look a bit at, let's say, our, our future vision, where are we had it? Well, it's for the first time that we want to make a body-worn sensor which can collect medical-grade images of vital organ function, so really from inside a patient's body, and to allow that continuously and non-intrusively. You won't have to implant anything or look Let's say really open the body to see what's going on uh, inside there. So I put a few, let's say, uh, use cases in your potential future use cases that kind of speak a bit to the to the general audience. Uh, so uh, imagine a future in which, for example, uh, yeah, for 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 sports. Uh, I think a lot of people might have kids which uh, which do sports. Um, and uh, typically, at least my kids, they do a lot of sports. So when I send them each year, I have to go to the to the doctor and I have to have them sign a paper that they're fit to do sports. But basically, what do they do? So they check um, with a stethoscope, listen if the heart is OK. They look in the ears, look in the throat, and then they say like, OK, yeah, you are fit to do sports. Of course, that doesn't really say anything on how really how physically fit the heart is. And there's unfortunately still a lot of uh, Let's say a lot of accidents where the heart condition was not OK and, and people with intensive sports, they still get, uh, a, a, let's say, um, a seizure. So what we could enable is actually to uh, to allow the doctors to apply such a patch and then let them actually do sports for like a week on the end and then have a good evaluation of how fit or unfit really the heart is for, for sports. So another kind of metric. Um, so other things could be, for example, digital hospitals, uh, especially now with COVID has become uh, very much to the forefront where people are really looking for solutions to really allow monitoring uh, or even yeah, looking what is going on from a distance without having to call the people into the into the hospital. Also, of course, home care is it's it's a very uh, growing field uh, with with uh, let's say the society uh, becoming a much 
more percentage becoming older. Uh, so what you could enable by such a patch is actually to allow the people to go home earlier and uh, help them to detect heart failure from a phone. So still allow them to give a quality follow up from uh, from home. Good. Uh, of course, have to get to that point, we need, let's say, a realistic roadmap. Um, and for that, what we have defined is, uh, is, is what you see here below. So we aim to start in intensive care because there's a real need to have such a solution there. So there's nothing really which can non-invasively monitor heart condition. And mind you, I'm not talking about uh, ECG performance here, which tells you something about the electrical functionality, but we're more talking about the mechanical functionality of the heart, the pumping functionality. So it's important metric that they need to know in the intensive care, because if something goes wrong, they need to know in a snap second what they, uh, what they need to do. So nowadays they measure the performance, but they do it invasively with catheters, which have a lot of uh, drawbacks there. To start with, when you put them in, they can cause, uh, in some cases, because you put them mainly in the artery uh, and you actually put the catheter all the way into the into the heart chamber. So while you're putting that through the artery, what can actually happen is that you have uh, that you have rupture. So that can lead to internal hemorrhaging. So not really uh, very uh, very comfortable. It cannot stay too long because uh, you have risk for infection, and it's even not that uh, that accurate. So right, uh, so beyond ICU, there's also use cases in regular post-operative hospital, home care already talked about, and also further along in the track, uh, there's also consumer applications. I won't stand too long still with this uh, in view of time. Um, but basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to shrink these traditional tools, which you need very trained operators to really put them in place and look what's going on. So we want to shrink that whole tool in a patch format and let it do everything uh, automatically. So that leads me actually into the into the next slide because to enable these uh, these applications, um, well, let me take a step back. Eh? So you could ask yourself why something like this is not in the in the market yet. Well, it's mainly because uh, the solutions are not out yet out there yet which allow this application, and this is driven a lot by uh, by custom chips uh, and custom uh, custom solutions. So let's maybe start with the most uh, important one, which is the, the sensor technology. So that's actually one of the main reasons that such a solution is not out there yet. You have several key requirements if you want to monitor the heart with such an ultrasound patch. So your patch needs to be actually relatively a large area to cover a big enough part of your chest to view the heart. It needs to be flexible and if it's wearable, it better also be cost effective. So such a sensor is not out there yet in the market, which is why we're custom developing that together with our partners in, uh, in IMIC. So they're real drivers uh, to develop this, uh, this new technology. You of course also have the support electronics by, uh, which are behind and I'll talk uh, on that a bit uh, more later in the later slides. So you will need to be able to efficiently handle this ultrasound data because you don't have a lot of power available in these patches. And then, of course, the third big part is uh, the algorithm. So the patch needs to be smart. It needs to be able to extract, uh, let's say, key physiological parameters automatically and also by the way, detect automatically where the heart is and zoom in on the features that are of interest. So quite a lot of advanced algorithms which are needed there. So for this, we're actually working together with KL with the group of uh, Jan de Hoge, Professor Jan de Hoge, uh, which is one of the world leader when it comes world leaders when it comes to uh, research and development of advanced algorithms for ultrasound imaging of the of the heart. So going to a bit more detail on the kind of let's say the the product, what we are, uh, what we're making, how, how it looks like. But we want to come to something like this, which is actually a fairly thin shape that is non obtrusive to wear, and it is overall uh, overall flexible. So not only the electronics, not only the sensor needs to be flexible, but also the housing uh, and all the support electronics which are uh, behind it. So if we have a deeper look into that, if we look at the backside, for example, uh, you will of course here have the adhesives on top, which will make sure that your patch in the end will adhere to your body uh, for sufficient time without causing any uh, adverse effects like irritation and stuff like that. Uh, and here again, uh, this gray part which you see here, that would be our custom designed uh, sensor. So it's really a fairly large sensor, a couple of centimeters by a couple of centimeters. Uh, on each uh, side. Again, custom designed. If then we look at the back side, um, also there, uh, there's some ICs present there, but one of the main ones is of course the, the driver IC, which is gonna drive and read out the, read out the sensor. Uh, so if you look 
uh, yeah, at what, what is out there and, and we see what kind of power requirements we have. We really very quickly end up with a custom uh, with a custom solution. So custom IC, which leads me into the into the next slide. Uh, and so the product capabilities which are driven by ASIC design. So as I mentioned before, our patch will be used several days on end. Um, and we'll really do an automated monitoring of the mechanical functioning of the heart. Now it's quite a lot of sensors that you need to drive uh, in the order of several tens of uh, thousands. Um, and you also drive them at relatively high frequency. Think about a couple of, uh, of megahertz. So you think about the data rate that's actually quite uh, quite substantial. So if you're not smart on how to deal with it, you're never going to be able to uh, to put that in a, in a patch format. Um, so you really so we, we evaluated that so we looked at off the shelf components, but they can definitely not meet our requirements for driving the patch for long duration. So we really have to go to custom ASIC design where we really do very smart things uh, to keep the, the power consumption under, under control. So if you look at the ASIC functionality, what do we need from it? It's mainly, let's say, generating the ultrasound signals and so generating the pulses to drive the sensor, receiving the reflected signals, and then also filter and digitize and run all our algorithms which we, uh, which we need. Of course, as you know, ASIC development is not uh, is not cheap. So how do we deal with those costs? So we do a lot of upfront uh, system modeling and digital emulation, as it's important to understand the system and the sensor and how it interacts with the different components. So that helps to reduce the risk on the on the development. And also, once you go to this ASIC design, uh, multi-layer mask sets uh, can actually help to offset the cost for developing ASICs, as you don't need the more expensive mask sets to uh, for development. Uh, going into, let's say, a bit more our uh, system approach, um, how we model that, how do we set it up? Well, we follow a model-based uh, system engineering approach, which actually, instead of having textual requirements, we really drive that with a uh, with a model, which is a schematic representation of your of your architecture. And that's maybe familiar to you, but typically you do four levels where you first start asking the question, what does the user want from the system? And then you go to the functional level. We say, if that's what the user wants, what does my fun what does my system need to do? Once you know that, you can stop mapping that really on functionality, how the system will, will really fulfill all your needs. And once you know these needs, you can actually start mapping them on, on components. So we really use software for that, uh, and we really use a uh, yeah the, the full MBSE approach. Um, so typically, what you're going to do is you're going to do an architectural definition where you put everything into uh, let's say uh, diagrams that link different levels also together. An advantage of this is that you have one single view of your system, which is what we call the crown truth of the uh, of the system. Make sure that all the stakeholders understand the system well. Then once you want to let's say generate the requirement documents you can actually automatically extract that from the system yeah, i imagine i'm going a bit over time so this is the last slide i, I promise um, then the next big part in our model-based approach is of course yeah, this virtual uh, this virtual design so what have we done around this is we actually have a full pipeline in place to do automatic segmentation of uh, full uh, thoraxes including uh, lungs bones body surfaces ribs so with that actually having that virtual model in place, we can start doing imaging experiments, really put the patch on top of that, test different algorithms to steer, focus the ultrasound beam, and in the end, see what kind of images that you get back uh, from which you can extract certain image quality metrics, but also help them to optimize and uh, develop the, the algorithms. Good, it was a bit longer than uh, the eight to 10 minutes, so my apologies for that, uh, but that's what I wanted to present today. Thank you, Steve. Uh, but the questions we will park till the end. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, so I suggest that now Jan Willem takes the floor from Antilop. Yeah. So. yeah. So Jan Willem, if you can start sharing. Yes. Yeah. yes. Ah, I see you already, that's good. Hello everybody, thanks for the invitation, Romano. You're welcome. Looking forward. Um, Yep. Can you see? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, very well. All right. So, Antelope Diagnostics is a company that was founded in in 2019 um, by myself. So I'm, I'm the founder and the CTO of the company. Um, I've been working on the technology. Well, we started, let's say, 10 years ago, uh, and at the moment we're a company of uh, around 35 to 40 people. Um, who tried? Who are trying to bring two products to the markets in 2022? 
which all are in the consumer healthcare markets. Um, and the key technology to enable this is uh, the silicon photonics. Um, so what are we what are we doing? We, we are really focusing on, on home diagnostics. So we built a system that um, allows to do that. And uh, yeah, what you see here on the slide is um, a few typical applications where people who normally have to go to the hospital need to see a doctor, uh, need to get an appointment, get a get a sample checked. Um, but it would be much more easy for them if they could do this um, at home. And, and uh, an example of that is anything that has to do with, um, with STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. People would prefer to test this in, in anonymity rather than having to go to a doctor and, and, and explain this, this story, let's say. Um, everything that has to do uh, with infectious diseases such as COVID and flu, if you want to contain the, infectious, uh, the infection or the, or the epidemic rather, um, it's handy if you can test yourself at home and then do a smart qu uh, quarantine, for example. Um, then we have everything that has to do with chronic, uh, chronic diseases. So everybody has to regularly follow up uh, on their treatments, on their biomarkers uh, to get control over their disease, such as heart failure, diabetes, uh, many chronic diseases. Um, and then there's also application in, in, in lifestyle or let's say in, in, in traveling if you want to see if your vaccine is still working. Um, so given given the setting, it's actually surprising that um, there is not so much in, in, in home diagnostics. Um, actually, there are just two um, successful uh, home tests at the moment. Well, there are maybe more, but let's say there are two very successful, very well known ones. Um, and that's a glucose monitor, which is being used all the time with people who have uh, diabetes. Um, they use it to test their glucose levels to, to uh, administer their insulin. So it's really something that is used very, very often for everybody who is a diabetic. Um, and then the second one is, of course, a pregnancy test, uh, which is also used uh, often for the same purpose. Um, surprisingly, these technologies are 20, 30, 40 years old. Um, and um, they, they have not been really um, innovated upon. And so um, you could, it's, it's actually very difficult to use these technologies um, um, for other applications. And that has, it, has everything to do with the technological constraints of these two specific technologies. So if we then fast forward and look at the technology that uh, a doctor or a clinician are using, they are more advanced, uh, they test the samples in a more performant way, but it has been difficult to bring that performance into the home. Um, and that is actually exactly what, what Antelope is, is trying to do. Um, so if you want to make a good home test, what, what do you need? You need a technology that is not very expensive, right? Because um, if we look at the devices that, it, that a, a doctor is using, or that a lab is using typically costs anywhere between 5,000 and, uh, and 50,000 euros. Um, so obviously that cannot be afforded. That's, that can, that's not affordable for the individual. It has to be very easy to use um, and the performance has to stay on the level of, of the clinical lab or you will have a hard time introducing it in the market or a hard time getting it regulated. So this really presents a, technolog a technological challenge for which, uh, at least in our solution, silicon photonics was a key uh, cornerstone. Um, so this is what we are developing. Uh, what you see on the left is, so this is, this is a render. Um, our prototypes uh, look the same though. Um, so what you see on the left is, is a cartridge. That's um, something you just you use only once. So you put your sample um, in the in, in the inlet there, so in the little hole. Um, inside of this cartridge, there is a photonic chip. What happens is the liquids or the sample, and it can be a blood sample, a urine sample, or a nasal swab uh, sample, uh, which is then eluted. Um, so this sample runs over the photonic chip, um, and then the readout unit, while this is happening, um, analyzes um, the biological activity that's happening on top of that photonic chip. And that analysis is done by sending uh, light through the chip. So basically this, this readout unit is nothing more than um, some very basic optoelectronics that send light, capture light, 
and then analyze those uh, those light signals and at the end show the results to the to the user. Um, the innovation or or let's say the, the the game changer for us is that typically these these type of photonic chips um, they require quite some expensive um, optoelectronic equipment um, that can cost or that can lead you to uh, to a device uh, a few ten thousands of euros. And uh, given some, yeah, clever engineering, let's say, or some or some specific components that we use, um, we were able to reduce the cost of this readout unit, um, such that we can sell it for for 50 euros without really, uh, yeah, uh, giving in on performance. So that's a very important element uh, moving forward that we can bring that diagnostic power of the lab really into people's hands. Uh, if you then want to do a different test, so uh, we are making uh, two tests at the moment, one for uh, COVID flu and also a test for STDs, and they can be read out by the same unit. So you buy the, the small lab and then you buy separate tests. If we then have a little bit of a look at the photonic chip, um, what, what is happening is yeah, similar to what I just explained, um, but the, the, the yeah, the technology is a silicon nitride technology. Um, we use waveguides. So what happens is uh, what you see here is, is an, an illustration of a collection of waveguides. So you see that light is pinging on the left. Uh, it couples into a, um, yeah, a structure, a circuitry of, of waveguides. And here there is a, a blood sample that is running over our chip. Um, and the thing that we want to detect, the analytes, the bacteria, the virus, um, is then um, binding to our waveguides and the light that goes through can detect this. Um, it, it, its properties are changed depending on the amount of binding and um, there is a camera system that then at the other end collects the light and analyzes the, uh, the amount of, of, of analyte that was present in the sample to begin with. Um, so in that sense, it's a bit like a, a very sensitive mass sensor that can detect very small changes in concentration. Here on the top right, you see how the real chip uh, looks like. Um, and if you look at what we what we can bring to the to the consumer or, or to the healthcare industry with this, it's basically we can detect a uh, we can do an analysis in in 15 minutes, single drop of sample. We keep the lab quality, so we go over 90% clinical sensitivity um, and we try to keep it in, inexpensive, so um, a readout unit and, and a test for around 50 to 60 euros. Um, I added, I also want to talk a little bit about this, I see that we're roughly around eight minutes, because um, this, what this illustrates is, is yeah, how quite long it actually takes to take a technology like this from the first days um, to where we are now, which is one one year and a half away from the market. Um, you see here the years. Uh, what you see here is is the the type of, of uh, fabrication that we have done. So um, we were greatly helped by the MPW format. Um, so the Antler project was was started in, in 2014, 2014, 2015. And before that, at Ghent University, as Romano explains, yeah, there's, there's not really budget to do a full run to make a full mask set, so full run is 15 wafers. So we're restricted to MPW, so well, restricted to uh, enjoy the access, of course. Um, and that allowed us to build the circuitry, uh, first on a component level and then on uh, on a circuit level. So that's 2000, that's actually earlier than, than, than that, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14. We're all on these small amount of chips, and then we could we could gather the money and do a, do a run, and we could get our first chips when we started the Antelope project, when we got some some funding together to start really building biological assays on top of that chip, on, on top of those chips, for which you need a bigger volume. And what you see if we if we move forward, well, we were founded in 2019. You see that we're always going between full runs and MPWs. Uh, MPWs are good for us to try a new generation of, of a chip, so the different colors are the generations, and then the full runs is needed for us to give our biologists the material to build the assays upon. And especially, uh, especially the last four years, uh, this has greatly accelerated, so we're now doing around 60 wafers 
uh, per year, and that's just for development, that's just for material to build essays on. Um, while the maturity of the chip is actually quite mature and, and, and has, has not changed too much from, uh, from 2016. Um, so it really tells you the importance of being able to yeah, make a, a stable component and then the effort it takes bringing that forward into a diagnostic product or into a consumer product because we are still a year away from, from the markets. Uh, and if you compare the amount of people that worked on the photonics back then, which were two people, uh, with the amount of people and, and, and one uh, biologist at the moment, we only have one photonics engineer left and we have 25 biologists uh, all working on those on those chips, uh, explaining a little bit the, the need for material. Um, so I think to, to conclude, I see that I'm going over time a little bit. Uh, I won't go too much into the business cases, but um, I'll just keep it in at the, uh, yeah, explaining a little bit what we are doing. So indeed we are, we are making a self-test for flu COVID. So how should you see this? Um, if you have a risk contact, if you think you have been infected, uh, or if you have symptoms, you can buy our test in the supermarkets online, uh, in the pharmacy and do a test and a test will, will tell you whether you have flu or COVID. And it will tell you at, um, let's say, similar performance of the lab. And that's of course the big differentiator towards the rapid tests that, that, that are now coming on the market. We typically have clinical sensitivities around 60 to 70 percent, so they miss three or four out of ten cases. Um, although they are at the moment claiming higher sensitivities, um, this will drop in the next years uh, because, uh, because of the push, the industrial push or, or the governmental push to bring these products on the market. Which, um, which boosts their clinical sensitivity. But yeah, without going too much into detail there, um, that's our, our first uh, product. And then the second product, uh, which, which we want to bring uh, on the market in the same year, is, is all about uh, anonymous testing for STDs. So uh, I think you can imagine that this is something people feel, feel embarrassed about. They would rather have an anonymous test. Um, and so that's another uh, important product for us to allow comfortable testing in all privacy um, in your home. All right, I'll, um, I'll keep it at this, which is um, more or less still a little bit uh, in time. Um, yep, yep. Thank you, Thank you Joella. Joella. Um, Then um, I give then the floor to Peter, Peter from to Yeah, thank you very, thank very much, much Romano. Romano. I, uh, I uh, hope my screen, my screen is visible. visible. Yeah, there is an echo. I think now it's solved. I muted Jan Willem. Yeah, you yeah. can go. Yeah. OK, thank you very much for the invitation, Romano. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Harp. I'm associate professor at uh, TU Eindhoven. And I'm actually working in a group where we do uh, design microelectronics integrated circuit design. Uh, we do that for many different applications. Um, but today I want to focus on a few examples uh, where we develop ICs for medical applications. Um, we do that always together with industrial and clinical partners where we bring the, the knowledge about circuit design and the other partners bring the knowledge from the application side and we put this together um, to make this, uh, these projects a success. So I want to give in a nutshell a bit of simple short overview and hopefully I manage within the time uh, about what we are doing and why microelectronics is important here. Um, so first I want to explain what is a bit the difference between electronics versus microelectronics. So uh, with electronics, I mean that you can make circuits with electronic components like resistors, capacitors and transistors on a, on a PCB, for example, and they can do some kind of electronic function for you. Now microelectronics are kind of similar as electronics, but the difference is that you put all of those components inside a single piece of silicon, as you see here, and then you can do all that function in such a small form factor. So this thing here that you see is actually two by two millimeter. That's a piece of silicon, and that's actually one of those mini ASICs that were mentioned earlier by Romano. Now, do you always need that? Well, not always. If you have equipment in a hospital, maybe this, this size of electronics is perfectly well, uh, but microelectronics have some advantages. On one hand, you can get uh, usually more performance out of it. It can be much faster, for example, in operation compared to the old school electronics. You can really optimize it for your application in a better way. 
Uh, the form factor is clearly different. It's much, much smaller. So especially if you go towards wearable or implant solutions, um, that's much more suitable. And also importantly, the power consumption for the same function is often lower if you design it in an IC. So that's kind of the background. And with microelectronics, we can make things which are very small in size, very low in power consumption. So just a snapshot of where this is useful. Uh, I sketch here kind of two domains. One is Internet of Things. Those could be all kinds of electronics uh, that can measure the signals in your environment or that can wirelessly communicate that. And if you integrate this, you can do this with power consumption numbers in the order of picowatts up to milliwatts, which is relatively small. And the sizes of these circuits also, they can be micrometer to millimeter size, which is very, very small. If we turn to medical domain, what does that mean? Well, here are a few examples that we did in our group. So uh, over here, for example, you see a very small PCB with a chip in it, which is a single chip which can record an ECG. Uh, and you can do this with a very low power consumption thanks to integration. The two examples I want to discuss a bit further today are uh, the two on the right hand side. Um, this is a, a circuit uh, which can do pregnancy monitoring and another one which is for ultrasound applications. So a bit more detail about uh, first the ambulatory pregnancy monitoring. So this is a, uh, a research project that we do. It's funded by the NWO, which is, let's say, the uh, the funding agency from the, the, the Netherlands government. Um, and the aim here is to uh, monitor pregnancies, to monitor the health status of a fetus um, in an ambulatory way, so outside a hospital environment. So what we aim to do for that is that we would like to have a, a set of electrodes on the skin of the mother, which try to pick up the signal which is generated by the fetal heart. And by combining the information of all those electrodes, we can hopefully measure in the end the fetal heart rate. And the variation or the value of the heart rate can give us some information about uh, the well being of the fetus. Now, this is a little bit complicated because uh, the fetus has a small heart. And we don't know exactly the location and orientation of the fetus either. So that's why we do need a a large array of many sensors and we need to adapt which ones we use in which combination to detect the heart rate. Another issue is that these electrodes here that we use are so-called capacitive electrodes, um, so they can be integrated in clothing because you don't like to use the more conventional wet electrodes, which you have to stick on the body. That doesn't work and it's not very friendly if you want to use that for a long time. Now, this advantage of such electrodes is that they have a very poor signal quality and they have also issues in terms of reliability, robustness, sensitivity to artifacts, and so on and so forth. And that puts a lot of constraints on both the electronics, so the amplifiers, the digitizers that you need to develop, but also it makes the signal processing uh, difficult and required in order to get um, a decent measure of the heart rate. So because of these challenges, and also because this system in the end should be wearable and reasonably small, um, it is required here for these front ends that we really use a custom microelectronic circuit in order to record the sensor information. So on top of that, we also need signal processing. So that's a bit out of my scope. I really focus a bit on the hardware here, uh, but definitely signal processing is also needed uh, to get the final signal out. So just as a sketch, I want to show you a bit um, what we did in the project. So. Um, the first step was to do a feasibility study and because at the beginning you do not have all your electronics developed and it's sometimes a bit hard to make your final ASIC if you don't know exactly for sure yet um, what the challenges are or to what extent certain challenges are truly challenges. We started with an early prototype where, in which uh, many components are based on commercial discrete components of the shelf and only the critical parts, which is really the front end amplifier, which is directly connected to those sensors, those are already made um, by ourselves with microelectronics in IC. Now, in this case, you see this is a four channel recording system. That's why you see four of these boards, but there are many other boards, analog and digital uh, voltages, references to make the whole system work. So as a result, you see this is a pretty large box and for sure this could be made a bit smaller, uh, but the overall message is that doing it in this way with mostly commercial components becomes bulky and also the power consumption is very high. So actually in this case, there's a cluster of batteries and after a few hours, uh, you need to start to replace them. So this is not really 
the way to go. But at least this is a starting point for feasibility measurements. So the second generation, or actually the third one we developed in the project, is where we removed most of those components that you see here, all in an integrated chip. So there's a chip here under this protection layer, which is a couple of millimeters in size, which integrates all the functionality from here and produces a digital output that can be sent via a connector, which is not yet there, to the computer. Now, clearly, this is much smaller. It's a credit card size. Um, it also integrates 16 channels of recording rather than only four. And the power consumption is much lower, which means you can actually operate for a couple of days on a single battery. So it's clear that this is really having a lot of advantages thanks to the IC integration. You still see there are a few external components here, and that's okay because, okay, it's wearable. It doesn't need to be extremely small, so we can still have a few external devices. Um, maybe also nice to mention this is actually made in a somewhat older technology node. Uh, like Romano mentioned, this is a 0.18 technology, which is a good solution here because um, it's a bit more cost effective on one hand, and the older generation of technology is actually usually very good for these applications that need to be high accuracy, but not very high speed of operation. Uh, the second example I want to mention is actually in the context of a very large uh, EU project, a so-called Excel joint undertaking project called Position 2, um, where the overall goal is about a next generation of smart catheters and implants. So it's a large project with many different partners, academic and industrial within Europe. Um, actually, our next speaker is also part of the same project. I cannot cover everything because then it becomes a really long afternoon. So I want to focus on one sub project in this large program, uh, which is carried out by TUE in combination with Philips Research. So in that sub project, um, we look to ultrasound catheters for intra cardiac echo applications. So how does it work? Um, this is a catheter. It's an example. It's not exactly the right one, but um, you get the ID. You put this in a blood vessel until the tip uh, reaches uh, your heart. And then at the tip is a small ultrasound transducer array, enabling you to do local ultrasound imaging inside the heart. Now, what is conventionally done is that uh, the electronics that are needed to, to drive and to read out these ultrasound transducers Conventionally, the electronics are all externally. And that means along your catheter um, tube, you need to have a lot of cables to connect the transducers with the electronics. And that's not so easy because yeah, the tube has a limited diameter, so the amount of cables is limited. Uh, you can use very thin cables, but then the quality of the cables becomes poor. And this means in the end, your image quality or your resolution is degraded. So that's why in this uh, project, we aim to move at least some of the most critical electronics towards the tip. And then actually at the tip near the transducer, you can locally um, already digitize the signals from the transducer. And that enables you to have digital rather than analog communication along the catheter. And it has two advantages. First of all, the digital communication is more robust compared to the analog one. And secondly, you can do all kinds of smart digital things to reduce the number of cables. So in that way, um, it's expected that you can improve your image quality. Now the challenges here are clear that you don't have any space or almost no space at your tip. So you really need to make very small chips. Uh, we talk about millimeters. Power consumption has to be low because you use it in the body. And, and those are the challenges. And that's why, again, you need microelectronics. So just to give you a quick idea of what we do here, um, this is an example of a chip that is made. It's about one by four millimeter. It contains actually 32 channels of digitizers that can uh, take the signal from the transducers, digitize this, and then uh, send this further to, to the external electronics to, to make the image. Different compared to the AWAM example, where we still had a few external components. In this case, it's really important that really everything is inside the IC because you don't have place for any external electronics. And that's a challenge over here. So if you want to know more, of course, you can uh, have a look at the website. I think uh, for me, this, this concludes a bit the, uh, the short summary of the projects that we are doing. My conclusion takeaway message is that uh, by integration, you enable quite a lot of things. You can make very complex intelligent systems because you can put thousands or tens of thousands of transistors or 
components inside a few millimeter of size. You can make very small form factor devices with a very low power consumption. And this suits very well to medical devices which are becoming wearable or that are even invasive like implants or catheters. So uh, for more information, you can have also a look at our own website and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter, um, for a very nice uh, presentation and also for introducing already the next speaker, Faso. You can see her now. Um, so Faso is from the Technical University of Delft, but uh, also assigned to uh, Fraunhofer ISTM, and that's also where she's based at the moment in Berlin. So Faso, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can. OK, good. And you can see also my slides, right? Yes, as well. OK, excellent. So uh, um, um, my talk will be about um, how we actually can use microelectronic chips for bioelectronic medicine. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, how to engineer long lasting and specially selective active neural implants. Uh, my name is Vaso. Uh, Vasiliki Yaga. Uh, I'm assistant professor uh, in, in the bioelectronics uh, section in uh, Delft, and I'm also uh, affiliated with the uh, Fraunhofer Institute uh, of Reliability um, and Micro Integration in Berlin. Um, so, uh, starting with a short introduction about what bioelectronic medicine is. Um, here, what we aim to do is treat a number of conditions uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, chronic headache, or even paralysis after spinal cord injury without any more using drugs and or their side effects. Uh, now, we aim uh, to use instead uh, implantable devices with electronic components that are um, placed close to the targeted nerves. They use electricity, which is inherently present in our body, uh, to deliver local therapy and avoid side effects. Um, the aim of bioelectronic medicine is actually to give personalized therapy. And to achieve this kind of personalization, uh, we need to gain a precise control over the tiny structures in our nervous system. So we, a, one of our goals is to increase the specificity at which we interact with the nervous system. The uh, second goal um, is that we want to study both short and long term effects, and therefore we need uh, to have suitable neural interfaces. The, the problem with current neural interfaces is that they are usually of uh, two types. Uh, there are uh, the um, ones that feature very long lifetimes and uh, are relatively large in size, and, but unfortunately, the specificity at which these interact with neural tissue is actually low. And uh, the second uh, category is, uh, features higher specificity, smaller size, but unfortunately, a smaller lifetimes. So our goal is to develop uh, millimeter sized neural interfaces for long term uh, in neuromodulation and eventually to increase the specificity of these interfaces uh, when interacting with neural tissue. And the way we do that is that we use a combined approach where we blend uh, the boundaries between technology and circuits and we in innovate at this interface. I think we'll become, this will become clear in a second when I uh, introduce my next topic. So today, mostly I will be talking about uh, the longevity part of the uh, how to increase the longevity of the long term implants. So I will start with uh, the concept of packaging for long term implants. Um, here I'm using, I'm happy that Roman already introduced this uh, uh, picture uh, in his presentation. Um, so I don't have to uh, spend a lot of time on it. Uh, basically, uh, this shows the development of how conventionally packaged uh, um, implants have been developed over the years. And though, OK, we see a kind of uh, miniaturization trend, this is actually not uh, significant if we take into account the number of uh, years that have passed since the beginning. The conventional packaging of neural implants is based on titanium boxes, so all the electronics are placed in these titanium boxes, which ensure a hermetic environment, but they limit miniaturization. 
when we talk about uh, basically millimeter sized neural implants, we are not there yet with this technology. So uh, an alternative solution that we have been investigating is uh, conformal encapsulation. So what we uh, you, what you see the concept of conformal encapsulation uh, is the following: we use polymers or thin films, uh, which uh, conformally protect uh, bare uh, microelectronic chips. Um, this has the potential to uh, reach the miniaturization levels that we want. However, um, it does not ensure a hermetic environment. And the question here that we try to answer is, how can we guarantee decade lifetime for these implants? Um, one of the most common problems, actually, is that uh, when we are looking at uh, the long term stability of the implants inside the body, um, any uh, uh, um, uh, void that exists between interfaces will be very quickly um, saturated with water vapor, that water vapor will be allowed to condense into liquid water and will lead to delamination. So basically, um, we want to make sure that we ensure a good adhesion between all the interfaces. So here you see a common problem uh, of poor adhesion of a polymer to the uh, metallization uh, below. Uh, one thing to point out is that with implantable devices, we basically use specific materials that are uh, previously uh, have been uh, shown that have good biocompatibility uh, when used in the body. So uh, platinum is one of the most standard metals that we use for implants. Uh, here, what we uh, uh, have uh, investigated is a new uh, bilayer stack uh, made of um, hafnium oxide ALD layers and uh, silicon rubber, otherwise known as PDMS, uh, to insulate uh, this interface. Uh, the um, advantage of this bilayer is that uh, the PDMS fits, has high biocompatibility and biostability uh, inside the body. Um, the ALD acts as a barrier uh, for ions and has good stability and good adhesion to platinum. And we have shown uh, by conducting a long term 400, 450 days uh, soak study of uh, the uh, test, our test structures uh, in an environment that mimics the human, human body at room, room temperature um, that the uh, uh, there is good adhesion, uh, so the impedance of these uh, test structures does not change over the duration of the study. It's very stable. So what you see here is um, the impedance when we use the um, ALD layer alone and when we use the pi layer. Um, the, I, I have included, uh, you will have access to the presentation and I have included some um, references here uh, for everyone that is interesting. Is still like uh, you can go and check the publications. I unfortunately don't have time to go into the, all the scientific details uh, in this presentation. Um, so uh, the question now is, can we, instead of using this by layer, also use PDMS alone? And um, here, um, uh, this is a very recent uh, publication that uh, came out actually yesterday. And uh, you will be able to see that actually PDMS, though it is counterintuitive, can be used to protect long implants long term. Um, so this is, um, that was what I just showed, uh, is trying to address the packaging concept of implants. Um, at the um, uh, technology uh, domain. Uh, now, I want to expand this uh, and uh, introduce uh, the effect of the electric field uh, in the lifetime of those implants. So if we are looking at a high level schematic of such an implant, a conformally co encapsulated implant would look like, we have the microelectronic chip, some um, discrete components, um, the interfaces with the tissue, the electrodes, and the tracks. And here, from a, fa a fabrication point of view, uh, we see that those tracks appear to be the same structures. However, these are active neural interfaces, so we will have the electric field uh, superimposed on these. 
Um, and when we take a look at this and consider this, actually we see that these are not the same structures eventually in the body. In the body, we have an ionic environment and these um, tracks are going to see different kinds of stress signals. We have DC signals, we have AC signals, and here we will have, for example, biphasic signals. So the hypothesis that we have here is how, if we know how this electric field affects the lifetime of soft encapsulated implants, then we can use this knowledge to design for increased implant lifetimes. So um, what we have uh, seen here uh, in another study that we have conducted is that the failure mechanisms are actually stress signal dependent. So what we did is that we created test structures which we used to bias with DC or biphasic uh, signals. And uh, these test structures actually were platinum um, tracks uh, coated with uh, parallel. And here we saw uh, for the DC biased ones uh, that the DC signal caused electrolysis of the condensed water, which resulted in the cracking of parallel. In the second scenario, however, where we have a biphasic uh, signal there, then we see a platinum dissolution and migration that was ma the main failure mechanism. So very different. And actually, we also saw that these devices last overall longer. Um, now, um, looking again at our uh, high level schematic, what we also want to do is investigate what happens inside the chip, which is uh, where the uh, electric field is expected to be denser. Um, so we conducted a, a study to uh, investigate uh, how this uh, changes the, the performance, the participation of the, uh, what are the failure mechanisms of CMOS chips in the body. And we also uh, uh, came up with, uh, we, we also integrated measurements on chip to monitor the passivation layer. So we have two different tools that are CMOS uh, uh, com compatible, that can be integrated on the inside the CMOS chip um, that allow us to do this kind of investigations. The first one uses, uh, is a fully integrated uh, integrity monitor, which uses the changes in the interlayer um, dielectric resistance to detect any moisture ingress inside the chip and the metal layers of the chip. And the second one uh, is actually using the bulk of the uh, chip to um, sense um, the, uh, to evaluate the conformal coating that uh, is used as protection for this chip. Uh, so we have uh, shown that both these tools uh, can be used uh, to evaluate uh, the uh, coating uh, layers that we have. And particularly the second one is very well suited to be integrated in millimeter size and provide this kind of monitoring in a real application. Now, the, what I wanted to, uh, the take home message from uh, what I showed here is uh, that so far, um, Implantable devices, active implantable devices, have been designed, the packaging has been designed to have a lifetime of 80 years. When we move to smaller sizes and different concepts, the overall lifetime of flexible implants uh, can, um, can be increased using a, a tailored circuit design and tailored packaging. So we can extend the overall lifetime of flexible implants by uh, understanding how to design for those implants and how to package those implants. So, um, so far, the uh, IC design has been completely neglecting the way this package is going to be uh, built, the way the chip is going to be packaged. Now, the suggestion is to IC designers, uh, please take into account uh, the findings that we uh, have from the packaging uh, a way that um, for, for, from the packaging uh, concept uh, and understand what kind of signals to apply at the interfaces. For example, I showed the example of uh, AC versus DC 
to design um, a longer, for longer lifetimes. Uh, so in this way, by tailoring the design of non-hermetic neural interfaces, we can make them smaller and with longer lifetimes than the state of the art. Um, and very briefly, I also mentioned about the fact that we want to increase the specificity at which we interact with neural tissue. And here I want to show uh, the, uh, an ongoing activity. Um, uh, here we have, uh, uh, we are working on this on a new uh, project called Moore for Medical. And what we do is that we use MEMS uh, to increase the specificity at which we interact with neural tissue. And how we do this is that we use flexible uh, um, uh, micro machine ultrasound transducers, um, which uh, have a very high, can be fabricated with very high resolution um, on flexible substrates and will allow, allow to uh, focus the um, ultrasound uh, beam inside the um, internal environment of a diameter of a, um, one nerve. So uh, in this way, instead of stimulating ultrasonically the complete nerve, uh, all the fibers inside the nerve, we can uh, uh, be more selective and stimulate only the location that we want inside the nerve without being invasive to the nerve itself. So without penetrating the nerve, which is not possible with electrical stimulation alone. And it's also enabled here because of the MEMS uh, fabrication. Uh, that concludes uh, what I wanted to cover today. Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the uh, bioelectronics section um, uh, in Delft. Um, uh, for those of you that uh, know, uh, you can, we have a website, please uh, have a look at the website if you want to know more about what, uh, the things that we do there. Uh, also, uh, at Fraunhofer, similarly, and my close collaborators uh, in my current and former affiliations. Um, and uh, these are uh, the industrial uh, collaborators that are working close with uh, my team. Uh, and I want to also acknowledge the funding sources that has, have funded this research. And uh, I think that concludes my talk. Yeah, thanks a lot, Faso, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, also, the takeaway message about co-design is very important, I think. So maybe in the question and answer after the next talk, we can zoom in a bit more on that. So uh, to conclude the cycle of presentations, I now give the word to Bob, who will also dive deeper in the world of neural interfaces. So Bob, the floor is yours. OK, thank you. Um... Let's turn on this uh, screen sharing. Mm -hmm. Hold it up. And then, uh, so yes. It's visible. Okay. Yeah, we see your full screen. Perfect. Great. Okay, thank you. So thank you for inviting me. Um, what I will be talking about is uh, is work on on. Uh, on hybrid uh, interconnects uh, electrodes that is actually work from uh, Marco Bakula and Frederick Sesses in my group. My name is Bob Puurs. I'm um, actually emeritus, so I, I'm retired, but still uh, keeping an eye on the work there. Um, and I'm quite happy to hear uh, all the previous uh, presentations. Uh, this will make my life a little bit more easy because I will mainly focus on, on interconnects. So what to do with the chips. Uh, the motivation for this brain uh, electrodes actually is uh, to more understand the physics, uh, the functionality of the brains, uh, the diseases and, and etc. So there's a lot of interest and we're of course not the only ones to do so. Actually, in the history, there are a lot. There were a lot of uh, researchers uh, creating uh, electrodes uh, based on BEMS technology. Um, these were full silicon shanks with sharp tips that could be introduced, containing many electrodes. And actually, they are the say the uh, say the founding uh, elements and are still going strong uh, in in neurosurgery research. So these are what we then called is the, the, the heart, uh, heart uh, CMOS uh, neural probes um, that um, are extremely reliable, but they have a 
failure mechanisms in the sense that um, they're made out of silicon, so uh, they have to be uh, fragile, fragile. They are fragile, and uh, also biocompatibility may sometimes not be up to scale. Uh, on the contrast, uh, there are another uh, set of research that, that work on neural probes that are based on, on uh, polymer, uh, polymer-based uh, electrodes. Um, the problem there is that you have only a limited amount of, of, uh, of uh, electrodes possible due to the, to the, 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 the problems with the, with the interconnects on the, on the, on the carrier. Um, so the, what we try to do here in this, in this presentation is actually try to solve the, the, this, 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 this problem and actually introduce a chip on top of uh, on top of this polymer, and so and here comes actually the main uh, main bottleneck is is how are you going to connect those things together? So the silicon with the polymer material, uh, actually the metals that are deposited on this on this on this polymer. So that will be the focus of of this talk here. So just to picturize a little bit uh, what the work uh, of Marco Bakula is is focusing on. He is actually keen on on creating. He dreams about thousands, but I try to moder to to moderate it a little bit. So we are <coughs> yes, now I've been creating a 260 uh, uh, 56 uh, electrodes um, uh, shanks that can be introduced into the into a nerve fiber to create to create uh, a sort of knowledge on, on, on how those fibers are communicating with our, with our limbs. Uh, you may see that the, uh, the, 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 the basic, so the, actually there are insertion needles that are used to penetrate uh, the nerve and actually the actual electrodes are situated in this dark uh, region here. So here is a close up of these, uh, of this array of electrodes that are in contact with or are aimed to be in contact with the nerve fibers. Um, I will not elaborate on the electronics so, so but here of course because it's it's a it's a webinar that that has to deal with chips so I show a few schematics here of the electronics that are uh, being implemented in a MOS uh, in a MOS uh, developed uh, and must be developed by uh, by by the error practice service. So here this is the goal from Marco to go to thousands. Uh, up to now we have a 256 uh, array of uh, of uh, amplifiers that are connected to an uh, an FPG, FPGA that is remote on the on the from from the shank. All right. Um, so, uh, okay, just uh, a drawing of of uh, of a chip, just to show that this was really done. And actually, here we see the the final chip that uh, will be connected to the to the to the to the polymer fiber. And um, what is important, and this is also a key message that I wanted to 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 give to you. One of the nice things about about Euro practice service is that you actually can design the chip with a bond path layout to your wish. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, to your wish. So that means um, as a, as a, as a group working on in in medical systems, uh, the chips for us actually they serve a purpose. So we don't fabricate the chip because of the chip. We fabricate the chip because we want to use them in the system, and to use them in the system, they have to comply to the to the shape of the final product or the final uh, re, uh, the final research uh, device that you that we that we aim to. And the, the previous speaker also has has made reference to that, so that's one of the, the nice things. So you see here uh, where the the bats uh, are aligned. Actually, they will be now connected to the polymer polymer base. Here you see a picture again or a drawing uh, more to to be more precise uh, of this of this uh, design of the of this uh, of this multi electrode uh, implant that is going to be used. Um, the metals that are used on the polyimide are platinum and gold. 
So actually gold is, is facing the, the biological environment. Uh, we also provide a, a indium peroxide uh, uh, layer on top for impedance matching. And um, OK, so then this is the, the electrode that has to be put inside. Um, now, how to make um, the contacts? Um, uh, pitch is uh, 60 micrometers at, at this moment. Uh, and the, the, so the, the possibilities that we have actually could be uh, cold wire bumping, so making bumps. Uh, with a wire bond tool, but that is actually too irregular, so we will not be able to use that. Uh, the next one is uh, plated uh, aluminum, uh, sorry, gold bumps. Uh, so by plating um, is a very good candidate, and so I will briefly discuss that. And there's an also a, a uh, variation on that, which we call the rivet bump, as this will become more clear in a moment. The process flow, I'll quickly go through that. Um, we use uh, a first of all because you want to, to go for plating you need to contact all those electrodes one way of doing is that is at one side of the of the of the uh, of the of the poly polymer electrode uh, make it uh, temporary contact uh, with a, with a conductive ink um, in a later version we actually created uh, separate pads that could be cut off uh, to provide a, a much better uh, contact for the plating. Uh, these are details for the plating. I will, uh, you will have the slides available, so I will not go too much into detail. And then we go actually to the, a thermal compression, uh, th th thermosonic uh, um, compression and ultrasound, uh, ultrasonic agitation for the for the uh, contact. Now this has, uh, is a severe task. Uh, the, the, the tool we had in the lab, the fine phase lambda bonder, actually is a little bit uh, too young for the job. I mean, uh, the force of two kilogram is is on is on the limit to make a, a reliable contact on the 256 uh, electrodes. Um, okay, but okay by using a, an, an other equipment uh, other equipment it, this would be of course uh, be improved what we see here now uh, is uh, is the is the gold bumping uh, bumps before bonding and then after bonding um, you see actually through the the polymer you can actually see the chip underneath um, we see here uh, one uh, pad is has failed uh, actually. Um, this is uh, this is uh, showing that it is possible to go to go with this to go with this uh, with this uh, uh, thermal compression thermal uh, thermal compression uh, um, bonding. But the uh, as you can see, the reliability is is still to be improved. Uh, I think it's. We're up to 90% uh, with, the, with the equipment that we have right now. Um, the some destructive tests were done to show that actually the, the good adhesion that that was achieved uh, for those who, who were were working. And then there's an alternative technique. Uh, also, I try to to not to elaborate too much on it, but this is a, a technique where in which we, we what we called uh, the kind of rivet bump uh, technique, where the plating actually is done not on a full uh, electrode, uh, a full, full contact, but on a perforated, so a ring, a ring type contact. And then you actually create a kind of dip, which actually uh, has a, as a kind of, uh, I won't say uh, uh, a mushroom type, but it's it's kind of well, it looks more like like a rivet. Um, so here you see another, and then the last technique that was 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 tried is actually really uh, go through a technique where the poly emit, uh, and this is a test uh, sample actually, it's not in the, the real electrode, uh, has holes in it. Um, but um, the, uh, um, sorry, is perforated, so it's perforated, 
uh, um, by, by etching. And how is that done? So what we actually do is you take the chip, you put the, uh, they put the polyimid on top, then um, a mask is produced on top of this, of this structure, which is shown in this uh, slide here. And uh, it's a metal mask, uh, still through the topology variations, you can still align and make and make the the, the etched holes by uh, photoresist. Um, there there are holes here which then are uh, by plasma etching uh, are really being etched uh, through through the polymer down to down to the bond pads on the on the chip. After which uh, you do a depos deposition, and um, here also. Uh, by the way, this work is in is, is a work that is in progress. Huh? Um, you see that uh, there is a, a very good, uh, very good part. Uh, say partially it's it's successful, partially it's not. It has to do with with adhesion and layer uh, quality, quality, quality of of layer deposition, etc. So, but it, it it shows that there is a very good, very good, uh, very promising uh, possibility. Okay. Um, so these then is a, in a conclusion the the interconnect methods uh, that have been tried and what we believe have have some potential as uh, so the gold bumping um, it works fine um, for the 250 uh, contacts uh, if if we want to go to a much higher higher uh, count then uh, this uh, this uh, this version here is much more promising. Voila. Um, I think uh, that is what I wanted to tell uh, in the in the short amount of time that we have been allocated. Uh, what, we, what I also want to mention, so I think, and this is a, a message that I already mentioned, is uh, is that one of the nice things about about this 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 uh, service is that uh, we can go for a bond path layout that is that is uh, that is up to uh, up to the uh, say really customized. Uh, I take a very old example of uh, of Patrick Wouters in 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 the in the in the nineties. Uh, where uh, actually we were developing an injectable capsule, as you, the picture you see it here, it's, where it's, it's working on a battery, and this injectable capsule contains an accelerometer, a temperature sensor, and some identification. identification. Actually, it's a modification of, of the existing identification tags that were available. And um, so uh, to get a chip in there, so actually you see here, uh, the layout of the chip, which contains the analog uh, processing parts for the acceleration and temperature conversion, uh, the digital interfacing, and you see the bond pads are really at the end to make sure that you can really make all the contacts uh, within the restricted space of this of this capsule. It's a very nice example, I think, uh, showing the benefits of this of this service uh, here. Uh, this is the, the the last picture I show is uh, is the uh, final encapsulation with the with the communication coils etc uh, within uh, within that work. Voila! So this is brings me to the end of my presentation, and uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you again. Yeah.